Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. My name is Josh Davis. I'm Thomas Shane. And if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, check us out at youtube.com slash user slash Cur of Anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see our final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And if you have any comments during the live taping, please let us know in the show's feedback uh, Facebook group or send us a Facebook message and we'll get to you. So, Thomas, I'm going to hand it off to you. All right. So, uh, first of all, tonight we're being uh, joined by Corey Hastings again. He was uh, our guest last night. He's a good friend of mine. So, Corey, how are you doing tonight? Pretty good. How are you? Not bad. We're all doing pretty good, I think. Um, okay, so basically tonight our underlying theme of the show is going to be the myth of the social contract. Now, uh, any anarchists or libertarians watching who have debated with statists in on online discussion boards or anything, uh, or even in real life, I'm sure you're no stranger to the social contract argument. However, if you're unfamiliar with uh, the liberty movement or this, any of this, or the social contract argument is... Uh, Basically, it's a concept that's been devised by people who support uh, the existence of government. Uh, the, the, basic, the basic idea of it is, uh, the argument is, that by living under a certain government's rule, you agree to adhere to certain uh, terms and conditions, um, some of those conditions being you agree to be taxed. You agree to go along with whatever social programs they implement. You agree to follow laws, etc. Um, and basically the only way that you can express or exercise your non-consent to this contract, this contract is to uh, move to another geographical area, which is probably dominated by another government with its own social contract myth. So, uh, yeah, we're just going to be talking about that and basically all the aspects involved in that and all the things that uh, are justified or, or that they perceive are justified through the, this argument of the social contract. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess a good place to start is, is uh, taxation. We've all probably been involved in discussions on taxation, and if you bring up the fact that uh, taxation is extortion, it's theft by way of extortion, uh, which is basically threatening someone using coercive force and saying that um, you're, you're either going to pay me this money or I'm going to hurt you, or in the government's case, you're going to pay us this money or we're going to bombard you with letters and bills from the IRS and then eventually they will you know if you rack up a big enough bill or you you pop up on their radar enough they're going to they will come to your house they will kidnap you they will put you in a cage and they will keep you there incarcerated until you comply with their arbitrary demands uh, and the social contract argument is probably the number one thing that statists use to justify the taxation and by saying that by living in this geographical area, by being born, I'm a born American citizen. So when they tell me this, it's even it's even more laughable because, so by being born within a certain geographical locate area, under the rule of a government that happens to be dominating that geographical area, I hereby consent to having uh, my income stolen from me by the government and redistributed elsewhere. Uh, we do have no sales tax in Oregon, but there's still the income tax. So, and I mean, it's still a little theft is still theft. It doesn't matter to what degree or how you try to justify it. Um, and I just totally disagree with that, as most anarchists and libertarians do. That uh, uh, simply by living within a certain geographical area or under the rule of a certain government, you consent to being stolen from is ludicrous. So, uh, Josh, what do you? What, what's your take on that? How do you feel about it? Uh, how I feel is precisely what you just said. It's theft. It's uh, yeah. it's the initiation of the use of force against my will, and I it's it's being taken out of me. I'm not uh, subscribing to anything uh, per consent. I'm subscribing to building the roads just because uh, I'm. It's being stolen out from me. Uh, I'm getting a small benefit quote-unquote, but it's really not a benefit. It's uh, it's worse than it would have been uh, if it were provided by the market. That's yeah. where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. 
you know, purely economic terms in that sense. But uh, the mor the moral case of it is it's theft. It's wrong. It's it. Uh, yeah, it's force. Yeah. Uh, well, you, they, they they try to justify it by saying that it's not. It's not theft because you consented to it, and that's where the social contract thing comes in. A social contract argument is the illusion of consent. It's claiming that yeah. you consent to something simply by existing in, in a certain area or existing in a certain circumstance. And I yeah, don't... And yeah, I don't uh, buy more, it. more to the point, uh, a lot of people don't even get that if you were to not pay, then eventually they will come for you and they will put a gun to their head. There is no force, they say. Uh, you're doing it voluntarily. No, I'm not. I'm being told precisely what to pay. Otherwise, eventually, they <coughs> will come to your house and take you from your house or kill you yeah. if you really resist. So, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure Corey can attest to this. He's probably had this thrown out him numerous times, but... We're told that it, when you bring up the idea that it's not the idea, when you bring up the fact that forced taxation is theft by way of extortion, uh, we're, you're often met uh, with hostility and people will claim that that's hyperbole or that that's an exaggeration and that there will never be any violence used against you. You will never be aggressed upon. You're simply exaggerating because you're greedy and you want to keep all of your money and not have to pay for anything and reap all the benefits and everything. Those are the kind of just illusions of arguments that I receive from statists almost every single time that I... Uh, that's kind you know. of a, um, that's a... That's a mild form of an argument that they will, you know, uh, retort, you know, to you with. And, you know, more often than not, especially if you're debating with someone online, is... They don't really use mild arguments like that. They will normally jump to an extreme argument and say that you're you're a complete nutcase, you're a lunatic, you know, um, you're some sort of a right wing militia, you know, you want to blow up the White House or you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah. they do. They they really they just jump yeah. to the absolute most extreme form of argument that they could use against you. If you say taxation is theft, they say you're a lunatic terrorist. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so ironic. And they don't they don't even really try to argue the point most of the time. They don't try to deny that it's theft or try to, to form an argument against it being theft. They just simply say that you're a lunatic terrorist. Well, I receive that I receive the one argument all the time. It's all it's like a cookie cutter argument that I receive all the time from numerous different people that it's not theft because you consent to it by living here. Oh yeah. yeah. Per, per, per as per the social contract, and it's like mm. that's not a that's not an argument. That's just that's my biggest thing with the with the myth of the social contract. Uh, it's that um, it's basically. So, so if you're saying that, uh, so as as per the social contract, you agree to adhere to the terms uh, and conditions implemented by whatever government you happen to be living under uh, their rule. So basically, uh, they do whatever they want, uh, and if you don't like it, you can leave because by living here, you consent to it. So by that logic, this is a really good one I heard. I, I did some research on this beforehand just because I wanted to really make sure I had my ducks in a row. And I heard this same analysis or this same analogy come up numerous times in numerous different videos and articles. That by that logic, uh, in any tyrannical government that has ever committed atrocities against its own, its own citizens was also justified in doing that uh, based on the social contract argument. Because by living under their rule, you agree and consent to anything and everything they do. So therefore, the social contract is a universal justification system uh, for basically saying that government can do no wrong. Right. Yep. Oh, and I, I've actually had uh, status argue that to me before. Matter of fact, I have a screenshot of it, and I bring this up all the time when I'm arguing with this one particular guy because he said it, and no matter what he says from now on, anything that he says is, you know, pretty much invalid based on his one comment that he made saying that human rights do not exist and that uh, the only time that you have any rights is if the government 
uh, grants you those rights, and if the government refuses to recognize your rights, you have no rights. So the government can therefore mass slaughter and commit genocide against anyone that they want because the government has the right to to refuse to acknowledge those people's rights. Yes, because they call the shot. They they have no rights because the government said they had no rights. Right. No. So Not basically, he's saying, what I, he's saying what I just said, that the government calls the shots and that if you don't like it, then you shouldn't have consented to it by living here. You should have moved away. And that's just ridiculous to me because then... Uh, so when Hitler was in, was interning and uh, exterminating all the Jewish people from you know from Poland and Germany and all that, uh, are you telling me that those people consented to that by the social contract? Exactly. Because they that's didn't exactly like it? what this guy was saying. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that's what the debate was about. We had I don't remember where the debate started, but uh, we had gone in, gone into discussing human rights and how governments violate human rights. And I mentioned the Jews being exterminated in Germany, and his his response to that was that those Jews had no rights. It wasn't a violation of human rights because they had no rights. Their rights were not recognized by the government, therefore they had no rights. So right. according to him, it was not a violation of human rights to exterminate the Jews. And he well, literally I, said, I would say a better way of putting that is saying that it, it governments... Um, uh, infringe upon self ownership, the concept of self ownership, because technically he's not wrong in saying that uh, because all a right is is a moral, is a legal or moral entitlement. So if it's not legally recognized, it's not a legal right. Um, and if it's not morally recognized by everyone, technically it's not a moral. It's not a technically it's not a right. Uh, I'm a I per, I personally believe that you. Uh, only I, I hate to go off on a tangent here, but I just have to say you only have a right to what you can defend. Is my position. I'm not saying that I agree with it. I'm just saying that that's the reality of the world that we live in, because not everyone is going to. Res I believe in human rights, but not everyone is going to acknowledge those human rights. Obviously, government is one of the biggest non-acknowledgers of uh, human rights and self-ownership. So, are you sure that he wasn't? Are you sure that he was that he was advocating that, or he was just acknowledging reality? Uh, no, from the discussion that we had, it's it was pretty clear that he was advocating for it. Okay. Um, according according to him, you know, I mean, he's he's literally like worships the government. To him, the government is God, and if the government doesn't acknowledge something as a right, it, then it doesn't exist. Um, he sounds like a real sick son of a bitch. Okay, let's get off that tangent. And get back to the. Uh, um, well, yeah. hold on one one quick thing. I w I wanted to uh, acknowledge something that you might appreciate, Thomas. Uh, oh. That a social contract is an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. uh, social contract implies a contract is uh, an agreement between two people or more. That's but it's an agreement. And, and social means that it's just a group think thing and only a few people have a handle on it and not everybody will consent to it. It's just that simple. So well, social contract is an oxymoron. Yeah. Not only that, but, you know, just uh, con conventional, uh, I guess conventional wisdom, I guess would, uh, that might not be the best word, but conventional mm -hmm. wisdom would be that... Um, a person is not able to agree to a contract unless they're of a legal age of consent, which in the United States, in most places, is 18 years old, mm -hmm. and they have to they have to possess the uh, mental uh, faculties to be able to agree. I mean, if someone is mentally retarded, then you know, and they can't determine right from wrong and all that, then they're not they're not legally able to agree to a contract. And they right. can't be held. They can't be held. Um, they can't be held to uh, uh, force a contract. Yeah, to yeah. force a contract if they break the contract because they they don't have the mental faculties to understand what they agreed to. Right. They were a minor child. A minor child cannot agree to a contract. They need parental consent for any contract that is signed uh, to a minor child. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that I, that's perfect because I want to talk about that too. Is the um, 
uh, there's so much vagueness surrounding the social contract concept that, um, and I, I was discussing it with someone the other day, and they were explaining they were, you know, they were saying obviously it's not a real physical, it's not a physical contract. It's a concept, but um, that just, you know, it's the whole idea of um, how do I put this? So who, well, where did the contract originate from? Was it the people who wrote? Was it the forefathers? The ones? Was it the people who wrote the Constitution, or was it like where does this, where does this, it, in order for a contract to be legitimate, first of all, everybody who's involved needs to be aware of the terms beforehand, before consenting. They need to have it needs to be a conscious decision based on a full awareness of the terms, and then they need to consciously consent to it. So like, um, so yeah, like you said. How how do you how are you consenting to a contract that you were never informed on of the uh, the conditions of it? Let alone um, never mind that you were never made aware of the conditions uh, from the beginning, but also the conditions are constantly changing with every new law and every new piece of legislation. The conditions of this contract are constantly changing as do the lawmakers, so the people involved in the contract are constantly changing. So how can a contract be legally binding if uh, you never consent to it, you never, you never actively or consciously consent to it, you are not made aware of the terms beforehand, uh, and the terms and conditions are always changing. That's not, that's not a legal contract. That's not, and like Josh said, it's a contract between two or more people who are actively involved in it and aware of the terms. So right. it, in and of itself, the social contract, you're right, Josh, it is an oxymoron, and it's highly illegitimate and arbitrary, and it's invalid. Well, um, something else that I'd like to point out is um, when these people, uh, they argue that taxation is not theft because of the social contract. Mm -hmm. Well, um, even, if you, even if you did, uh, you know, believe that taxation is a theft. Uh, there's, there's another form of more direct taxation that has been used a lot lately in, in, in at least the past couple decades is being used more and more and that's called asset forfeiture. Oh. And what that is is the police can pull you over while you're driving down the road and say you've got two thousand dollars cash in your car, right? Yeah. And you know maybe you're going to buy a used car from someone or or whatever, and you want to pay cash. So you've got two thousand dollars cash in your car. The cops stop you, they search your vehicle, and they find that two thousand dollars. And they will, without charging you with any crime or even accusing you of a crime, they will simply say, "This is drug money, and we're taking it." Yeah. And there there is no recourse. You can't get your money back. You can't fight it in court because you haven't been charged with any crime. They just simply take your money. At gunpoint, at gunpoint, no less. Armed I mean, robbery. Yeah, right. it's literally yeah. armed robbery. And this is legal. This is legal, and they do it every day. As a matter of fact, I've got a story right here of a guy in uh, Arizona. The police and the DEA uh, and the SWAT teams raided this man's house. He's a medical marijuana patient, and right. it's perfectly legal. And, you know, they raid his house. They find drugs in his house, marijuana, which is perfectly legal. He's a medical marijuana patient. They take everything that he owns, over $455,000 of assets, just literally oh, from him at gunpoint. Wow. With SWAT team pointing machine guns at his head and everything, just flat-out armed robbery, took everything that he owned. And uh, to add to that, I keep on hearing about uh, how... People are uh, being raided for having um, raw milk and all that, like uh, at farms and everything. Uh, they got the cows and everything. And uh, people have their guns drawn and just literally raiding the whole place for uh, just causing a scene. Really, yeah. I don't know if they're actually stealing anything, but it, it reminded me of that. What well, I know said. one case down in Florida. This, I believe, it was last year. There was this was a um, an organic farming community down there. What they do is every year when they harvest their crops, they set up little stands, kind of like lemonade stands, you know, around the community, 
and kind of like farmers markets like throughout the whole community and they all sell to each other or trade and barter with each other and what happened is they've been doing this for years at the end of it when uh, when everything's sold and you know they have whatever's left over that they haven't been able to sell they take all that and they donate it to a local homeless shelter where they can you know that food can go to feed the homeless well the, the police raided their farms with SWAT teams. They took all that food that was being donated to the homeless, loaded it all into a dump truck, and took it to the landfill and just dumped it. Wow. Yep. That's wow. And and that's in their their reason for their excuse for that uh, SWAT team raid and dumping all their food is that uh, they did not have a catering license or anything to, you know, from the state to give them. To give them the authority to feed people, yeah, yeah. They, they needed a license from the government, you know, to have permission to feed people. And they didn't. To have permission to give food, to give yeah. away food, to never mind the voluntary transaction of selling the food, as if there was anything wrong with that. But yeah. you're not even selling it; you're literally just giving it away to someone. And that sounds like the uh, laws that are sprouting up. I see sprouting up left and right about get about now. A lot of cities are making it illegal to give panhandlers money. Yeah, and pitching tents. You can't pitch tents in certain areas because it looks bad for the businesses across the street. Yeah, I've yeah. seen videos on YouTube of cops going around with knives just slashing up homeless people's tents. Yeah. I've seen them. destroying wow. the tents. So do those people agree? Those people, though, they can't really complain, though, because they consented to that, right, by, li by living here? <laughs> they consented via social contract to being robbed at gunpoint, to yeah. having their uh, property destroyed, um, you know, to uh, being forced to starve to death because no one's allowed to feed them. Yeah. Um, how, how crazy, how insane of a concept is that, though? The fact that some arbitrary authority, some arbitrary source of authority can issue some social contract wherein everyone living in this geographical area under their rule is bound by this, uh, but they don't actually have to give you the terms or anything up front. You don't actually have to sign anything. You're just immediate, you're just automatically uh, bound by this Con, this contract, uh, yeah. they can change the terms whenever they want to whatever they want, and you, that's that's like basically saying here, sign this blank contract. I printed out this blank piece of paper. Sign your name here, and then later on, I get to add in whatever stipulations and conditions that I want, and yeah. you've already consented to it. That's basically the same thing, minus yeah, the yeah, actual yeah, physical yeah. signing. You're not signing anything. You're just existing. It just sounds like just made up. Like I said, it's a made up universal justification system to justify anything that they want to do to anybody. Uh, and so many people yeah. go along with it, including stealing your money, not just through taxation, but through uh, what? what is it called, Corey? The, oh, asset for, yeah, forfeiture? Asset forfeiture, yeah. Or sometimes they call it civil forfeiture. Well, they do that all the time. Like the like, um, have you ever seen that thing that it's a picture of a SUV? It's an Escalade, and the window has a sticker in it that says, "This used to be belong to a drug dealer, now it belongs to us." And such and such police department. And it's like, so stealing is cool as long as you're, uh, where as long as you have your magic government uh, arbitrary authority costume on, then you can steal from whoever you want, and it doesn't matter. So they're not even bound by the conditions of their own. Contract, but not only that. But when when they claim that 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 vehicle used to belong to a drug dealer, what proof do they have? Because when they when they do that asset forfeiture uh, thing, it's they not don't a crime. They yeah. you're never charged with a crime. You're never convicted. They just claim that this person was a drug dealer, and that gives them the right to take his property. Yeah. So, you know, they can say it was a drug dealer all they want, but we have no way of knowing that. And if it was, you know, what does it matter? Who did he hurt by selling drugs? And why? And why does that authorize them to steal his yeah. property without even a without even having a trial or anything? There's no there's no legal recourse. Like you said, there's no recourse against it after it happens. It's done. You can't do anything about it. You had no. There was no legal procedures in the first place. It was just we think we believe that you're. 
you're engaging in some behavior that is that that we've decided is not okay, and now we're going to take your stuff. Right. Yeah, and and uh, there there is no lawyers involved in it. There is no prosecutor, no defense. There is no judge. There's no jury. It's just that one cop pulls you over on the side road, or maybe two cops, so the cop and his partner, perhaps. But they stop you on the side of the road, and they say, I claim that you're a drug dealer, so I'm taking your stuff. Yeah. And it's it's his word against yours, and yours isn't worth anything. You know? No, and I know a lot of times when they take that stuff, it goes back into funding their, their police department. So if they yeah, do that... They, they often auction it, or if it's yeah. a... Vehicle, they might keep or to yeah. buy more things for the for the department, but how do you even know that they're not just putting it in their pocket? Because if it's not even a legal process, how do you even know they documented it? How do you know how do you how do you know that they're there are that cops aren't just driving around stealing people's money, putting it in their wallet and driving away? And they could do that. They don't have to turn it in as evidence because there's no crime being Exactly. Um, they can literally just take your money and stick it in their pocket. So it's not they That's not even theft by government. That's theft by another individual who's yeah. acting on behalf of government. I don't know. Yeah. That's so, but, yeah, this is the difference between law and legislation to me. Uh, law would be the contract, like a real contract. And then legislation, you know, they dream up all these other things, you know. Uh, well, what they tried to do uh, back in 1780. Six or whatever, when they created the Constitution, uh, they said that that is the social contract. And so, you know, it looks like a contract, it looks like a trust, and but it, it's, uh, it's just legislation. It's created by a few people, and they called it a contract. And then uh, within it, they create the legislation, they create the legislators, and they uh, create the big, ginormous... United States that we have today, you know what I mean? And all the corruption, you know, you'd think that it lies just at the federal level, but it, it seeps down all the way down to the police at the local level. You know, it, government is just corruptible and crap. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, I mean, if you want an example of it, you know, seeping down to the local level, look at um, a few months ago, I believe it was in Hawaii, where the police department sued uh, sued their state government in Hawaii to uh, to give the police and only the police the right to have sex with hookers. Where <laughs> prostitution is illegal for any normal person, but if you're a cop now and they won the case, if you're a cop in Hawaii, what? you have the right to have sex with a hooker. And you know what they're going to do though is they're going to use that as a way to uh, to prosecute hookers, and that's exactly what their, oh. their, um, their reasoning behind it was. They said, well, they, they can't prove that a hooker is a hooker unless she has sex with someone for money. So what the cops are going to do, they're going to pay the hooker the money, they're going to have sex with her, then they're going to take their money back, and they're going to lock her in a cage. <laughs> wow. So they're gonna Or maybe they'll wait a week and just do it once a day wow. and then prosecute her. <laughs> yeah, you know? Or you know they'll uh, they'll get a reference from her after they have sex with her and they pay her and they're gonna be like oh so uh, you know any of your friends you know do yeah, this right. got any good looking friends and then yeah. they'll just go and screw all of them and then take all their money and then you know lock them in a cage right right yeah. they're gonna and, screw them in more ways than one yeah yeah literally yeah and they're gonna get away with it too yep oh, yeah it's perfectly legal because they have a shiny badge. And uh, yeah. matching uniforms. That reminds me of the thing I heard about that was going on in Seattle, where like a hundred Seattle police officers filed a lawsuit against the city, um, claiming that they have the right to use excessive force to protect themselves because their job, because you know it's so dangerous to be a police officer in America these days, uh, that they have to just be. Uh, shooting everybody and beating the shit out of everybody every chance they get because that person might attack them and hurt them. So, and I actually know a guy who who lives in Seattle who used to be a he was like a security guard for um, I don't know if he worked for this not the city but he was a security guard for some area of Seattle and he used to he used to basically work closely with 
some of the cops because security guards well, work well, together yeah, with cops security. to crack to crack down on certain areas of crime. But he's saying it doesn't surprise him at all because he saw on numerous occasions Seattle cops um, just like beating up uh, homeless people in the alley just for covering up with a blanket in the alley because that's you know it's an eyesore it looks bad or whatever so let's beat the shit out of him. He said that was actually why that was the main reason that he actually quit that job because he couldn't stand to be involved or even or he wasn't involved but he couldn't stand to see that all the time. So see, that would be an example of a good cop. A good cop is a cop who quits their job because they realize how you know in failing corrupt the just the act of them being a cop is corruption. Yeah. And I mean the the only way that you could be a good cop and not quit your job is if you go around arresting all your fellow officers. In which case you're not gonna be a cop for very long. They'll either kill you or you're gonna get fired and run out of town. You know? Right. You just have to quit. Yeah. That's all you can do. Well, or like I said the other day, a good a good cop in my mind would be a cop that actively sabotages the, the operations of whatever department he works for. So he's constantly uh, alerting. You know, if he knows there's a sting going on, he'll be alerting all of those people, and he'll be yeah, call the house up and be like, "Hey, you guys are getting raided tonight at midnight." Just yeah, letting you know. dude, there's so many ways that they could. As being a police officer on the inside, you could sabotage the rest of the department, like misplacing paperwork on purpose and um, just all sorts of crap, you know? Or um, when you arrest somebody, don't read them their rights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then when they go to court, you know, the entire arrest is invalid and they just throw it out. Yeah. That, in my mind, would be a good cop or at least the best case scenario for a cop. Yeah. Or... um. You know, if, if you're arresting somebody, you know, you could tell them as you're arresting them, you can explain a process of how that they can beat the charge, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Be like, yeah, all you have to do is do this, this, and this, and make this claim, and blah, 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 and I'm not going to show up to court to testify, you know? I'm sure you they'd be able to fire you at that point. But. Yeah. yeah. Uh, t kind of bringing it back a little bit, but... Um, you know what's funny is uh, police have only actually existed not that long, just a few hundred years total, and, but it's, you know, justified by the social contract, you know, just like uh, fire departments are in certain areas and um, the monopoly on the roads is justified and yeah. the, the taxes, obviously, you are saying, um, but if you think about it, Nobody owns water, uh, you know, like the oceans. Nobody actually owns that. No country, no individual for the most part. So uh, I want to know, like, has anybody actually tried to have an anarchy on the ocean or in an island or something I know, like that? I know a guy who's done that. Um, just a couple years ago, this guy who... Um, I'm kind of friends with online. Well, I haven't spoken to him for a long time because what he did is um, he, he was having a lot of problems with the government. You know, they were trying to take his house and, you know, accuse him of, you know, uh, tax evasion and all kinds of other stuff. And they were literally just going to steal his property. So what he did hmm. was he sold his house, sold his property. He bought himself a houseboat, and he's living out on the ocean now. He travels around between you know, off the coast of California, down to, you know, Mexico, Mexico, the Baja Peninsula, Chile, and, you know, he just comes into port when he needs to stock up on food or whatever, and he bought himself a long-range Wi-Fi antenna where he can stay connected to his family while he's off hmm. the coast, and, yeah. you know. What does, what does he do, what does he do to uh, get money and that kind of thing? Oh, uh, he's, he's a uh, Vietnam veteran. He has a pension from you know, killing people over in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. There is there actually there's been two there's been two shows that I've seen on the on the Voluntary Virtues Network about the anarchy anar anarcho houseboating. Yeah. Colin Sleuth did one. And basically it sounds it sounds legitimate to me. The only thing my only concern is where does uh, maritime law apply and where doesn't it? Everywhere. Well, maritime law basically 
just states that as an owner of the boat or a captain of the boat, your word is law. You know, yeah. the, as long as if you're in international waters, no country has a right to pull up in their boats and tell you what to do in international waters. You in have, other words, anarchy. Yeah, as a captain of the social contract concept would not cover the it wouldn't apply to the water, correct? Exactly. Even though land can't, in my opinion, land can't really be legitimately owned, especially by government. I don't yeah. believe the government can actually own anything, but um, that doesn't stop them from imposing arbitrary conditions on people in what they uh, what they perceive as their geographical area. So. As for land ownership, I would argue that um, land can be owned, but yeah. you would only you would only own you would only have a, a valid claim to ownership over land that you are currently using. If you're not yeah. using it, then then you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're growing a field, nobody can just pull up and be like, "Well, this is land, so you don't own it. I'm just going to take all these crops." Yeah. You know, right. no, that's, you're you're using it. Those are your crops. Your work put into it. So that's your property on the land. Maybe you don't technically own the land, but you own your property on the land that you are using. Well, so that that means uh, that the state, in a way, is correct currently. In a way, meaning that uh, what we have right now basically is a fee simple system, and the way we own our stuff upon the land currently right now apparently would be correct to you correct yeah mm -hmm. so but uh, but the state owns the land itself so that would be incorrect is that right yeah okay I don't believe the state has any valid claim of ownership over anything uh, well yeah right but yeah. I'm, I'm like so uh, it, you know, like uh, originally when we broke away from the king, if if you want to call us we, you know what I'm saying? Uh, when we broke away from the king, from Britain, uh, land was granted to everybody at that time. Like everybody owned that land at the time. And then eventually it, the state ended up owning all of it. You know what I mean? Like uh, depending on the state you live in. You know, like Massachusetts right now. Massachusetts is completely owned by Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what they do is even the land that technically they say that, you know, is privately owned land, the government still claims ownership of it via property taxes. Because, it, right. you know, they, they have no legal right to charge you a property tax unless they are claiming ownership of that land. They're right. basically renting it to you. Right. Well, yeah, that's and that's how cars work as well. Same damn thing. That's like the whole concept of what we've been talking about the entire time then because the, the government has no uh, legal, in my opinion, uh, has no legal or moral authority to impose the things that it imposes on people who just happen to live in a certain area, um, yet it does, and that's how it's justified is through that, that concept of the social contract, which is obviously something that um, had to have been thought up by government in order to get people to believe that what they were doing was uh, it's, it's just a method of the government, government to legitimize itself. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, I forgot where I was going, but yeah, that's basically yeah. So, so oh, one thing I was going to bring up is uh, so usually, so if we're talking just our average uh, everyday contract, like a legal contract between uh, two people or something that involves. Uh, conditions. So part of the contract is that um, you won't violate this condition and I won't violate this condition. So both the conditions apply to all parties who are involved in the contract, right? Right. right so that's the government law. is involved in the contract and their laws are conditions of that social contract. Why do we have to abide by the conditions but they don't? Why does one part... How is it a legitimate contract when one party doesn't actually have to abide by the conditions? Only, only you do. They don't have to. Uh, that's what we were just talking about with the cops uh, taking money and taking property from people because they believe that they were uh, engaging in some activity and selling drugs or something. So they steal your money. That's theft. That's illegal. That's a condition of the social contract. 
why is it why is it conditional? Why is there no you know right because it's not, it's not a legitimate contract if if one party doesn't have to abide by it is what I'm saying. Yeah. The thing is, they are trying to uh, do it for society, and when in effect they're actually doing it for government. You know, they, it's a belief system. That's that's my simple answer. What do you say? I agree wholeheartedly. I I, I guess that was a hypothetical question because I know the right. answer. I'm right, saying right. it's a belief. I think that that's one more thing that makes it illegitimate and invalid is that one party doesn't abide by the condition. One party is not actually even uh, actually involved in it because government is not a person, so how can they be involved in a contract? Well, that's another thing, like, uh, if, person. if you're ever arrested for, you know, possession of drugs or prostitution or something like that, you know, there there is no victim in a crime like that. So what do they do as as a means to press charges against you? See, there has to be a victim for there to be a crime. So who do they claim the victim is? The Never. state. Yeah. So when you when you go to appear in court for a crime like that, when uh, they read the proceedings, the judge reads the proceedings at the beginning, it will be like the state versus Corey Hastings, or mm -hmm. you know the state. Yeah. Thomas Shane or something like that. It's always the state versus you because they're claiming that the state is a victim because there is, there is no victim. They they have to they have to have a victim on record to prosecute a crime. So they claim the state as a victim. Yeah. By, the, by them saying the state, they mean the state government, right? Yeah. So yeah. an imaginary entity which they claim is a person as the state of Michigan or the state of Massachusetts or the state of Oregon. Yeah. How can something that doesn't is how can yeah how can that be a victim when it's not a person? The victim needs to be a person, a conscious, intelligible person, not an entity, not a legal fiction. The only valid way that I could see that they could claim the state to be a victim of a crime like that is if you sold drugs to the governor in the governor's office <laughs> while he was you know while he was directly you know. And in the capacity, working in the capacity of governorship of the state. So yeah. then, and you, and in order for him to be a victim, even in that case, is you would have to somehow coerce him or force him into buying them. Because if, yeah. if he bought the drugs voluntarily, if he bought the drugs voluntarily, he's not a victim of anything. You would have to coerce him or force him, in which case then you can say, okay, he is a victim, and he was actively working in his capacity as a governor, therefore the state. Yeah. But uh, I want to clarify that, because when you're saying you're selling drugs to him, he'd have to accept, and that would be a voluntary thing. So, uh, again, you can't, you can't use uh, that as a crime. It's not a crime to sell something. I don't that's care what it is. Said, that's why I said you would have to somehow coerce him. But if you did yeah. coerce him, if you did coerce him or force him into buying them, then the crime is not that you sold drugs. The crime would be the coercion or the force or violence that, that to force him. But that would be theft, and that's exactly what the government is. And so, so or you know, uh, armed robbery, perhaps. Yeah. But, right. The act of selling drugs again is not a crime. Right. No. This I get. In an, this is another thing. It brings me to um, the subject of drunk driving. I get in a lot of arguments with people when I say that drunk driving should not be a crime. They're like, so you think that people should just be able to get drunk and go driving down the road and kill somebody? Blah blah blah. You know, whatever. Yeah. No, I don't. Think murder is already a crime, so there's no need to impose different preemptive crimes. Because there is no crime, and there's no victim until there's a victim. I agree wholeheartedly, as most libertarians do. Reckless driving is a crime. If you're swerving all over the place, putting people's lives in danger, then yeah, you should be pulled over, and you should be forced to stop driving, whether that be arresting you and holding you until you're sober, or simply taking away your car keys and making you walk home. I'd say know, just take the person home. I would say just take the, tell the person that they need to go home. Yeah. yeah either, Be either call a friend to come and pick them up, or you could, or you could put them in the back of the cop car and drive them home, give them a ride, or yeah. you could just take their car keys and make them walk home. 
Well, this is still a sticky subject because you're... You're still taking their property. Yeah, the problem is the roads are public. So, like, if someone owned the road, then whoever owned the road could make any policy he want, and it would be totally legitimate. I don't care what it is. But right now, the act of a police officer doing anything on the road to anyone that hasn't harmed anybody is wrong. It's immoral. But see, there, there, there are ways that roads can be publicly funded without government or the state being involved in it. Like, oh, sure. Uh, I, we're talking about, though, we're talking about the rules of the... Yeah, but, I mean, there would still you would still need rules on publicly funded roads even if the government didn't pay for it. You know, like you could run a community lottery in your town and use the, the proceeds from the lottery. Like, say, a construction company could start a local lottery program sell lottery tickets, and use the profits to build the roads. Yeah. And, and the, the roads are publicly funded, uh, you know, but there was, you would still need some rules on those roads. And you could have a private security company, you know, a DRO or whatever, to enforce those rules on the roads. And they would, that, yeah, that's the whole thing, though, is the cops, that's what the cops do but they have no authority to do that because they don't own the roads. They don't own anything that they're enforcing the rules on. They don't own the land. They don't even own the cars that they drive because those are all everything that they own is put, is funded through taxation. It's nothing that they own. So that's where the whole thing comes into play and we we might have to, you know, touch on this topic again on a on a later episode, but yeah. how do you that's a whole that's a whole balance how do you balance the safety of everyone because you know how do you balance having safety for everyone on the road but also not be infringing on people preemptively through like drunk driving laws and things like that because it's definitely an unpopular opinion but in my opinion it's the most logically consistent is you don't you don't threaten you don't use force on someone or threaten force on someone who hasn't actually done anything yet they just pose a risk to do I, them. I would say probably the most reasonable thing would be, you know, if somebody is driving erratically and they're clearly a hazard, you know, and they're risk, they're putting everyone's life at risk on the road with their bad driving, whether they're drunk or whatever for whatever reason they're driving like that, then, you know, you could pull them over, take their car keys, make them walk home, or get a ride from someone else. But you wouldn't be stealing their car. See, what you would do is mail their keys to them. So, you know, they'll get their keys back in the morning or whatever. Oh, you're that's a safety temper- answer. You're still temporarily taking control of their property. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, if they're putting everyone's life at risk, you know, you you couldn't reasonably just, you know, allow them to continue driving down the road, swerving all over the place and possibly hitting people. Yeah. I mean, ah. you, sometimes you have to, you sometimes you have to preemptively stop something like that from happening. I mean, uh, clearly they don't agree with that because that re- that relies on force. That's minarchy. That's not anarchy. Yeah, we're we're talking liberty here. Yeah, but uh, requires the initiative of force on someone who hasn't actually hurt somebody. I'm sorry, Josh. What I, don't saying? I don't see that as a violation of the non-aggression principle. I yeah, no, that's that's a use of force. Yeah. Well, I would I would say that you know a person who's driving erratically and putting everyone else's life at risk is the one who initially violated non-aggression principle because you know they're they're a threat to everyone around them he's a threat but he's not threatening anybody specifically yeah, yeah. anyway uh, I gotta uh, wrap this show up uh, so I'm gonna do the uh, currency analysis real quick uh, I'm sorry guys we're no, we've already run out of time almost um, so last time uh, last time we did this show was one week ago August 18th uh, I took these prices today at 8:27 uh, uh, August 25th. Silver was 1962. It's gone down about uh, 25 cents to 1937. Uh, gold was 12.9772, uh, and it is today about 20 dollars less at 12.7675. And Bitcoin has gone up about 65 bucks uh, from 453.59 to 501.93. Uh, we've got about 
five minutes left in the show if you guys want to keep on talking. Well, it's, I think we should go ahead and we should just kind of recap. Kind sure. of just basically recap the basic outline of what we were talking about. So this episode we covered the uh, concept of this of the social contract, wherein uh, from a realistic point of view, what the social contract is is a, is an arbitrary uh, set of basically it's an arbitrarily implemented contract on citizens of a certain in a certain geographical area living under the rule of whatever government is currently dominating that area, wherein they can implement any terms and conditions on you which they themselves don't have to abide by, and you have given your consent by as I said, living in that certain geographical area. So basically, uh, any way you look at it, it's just a bullshit justification system used to justify whatever they want to do to whoever they want to do it to. It's basically uh, the, the perceived trump card for a status to say that government... It's basically saying government can do no wrong because they decide... When you decide what's right and wrong, you can do no wrong because anything that you want to do, you just deem it's not wrong. You deem that that's right, and you consent to it by living there. So, I guess a problem would be uh, the ultimate problem is ownership, right? So, like if if um, if two parties don't have the ability to uh, take ownership of themselves and say yes or no to it, then uh, they've lost their ownership. That they've lost who they are, and they're just part of a hive mind, and uh, that's the idea of the social contract. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's uh, it's a group think of just a few people. I keep on saying the same thing. Never mind. I do too. I do it the whole show. I know it's like I <laughs> how many times I say too. damn words, but uh, right. Yeah, basically, how can you how can you be blindly just forced into a contractual agreement that you ne that you were never made aware of the terms in the first place. The terms are always changing. You were never asked your consent. It's not it's a farce. It's not a it's not a real it's not a logical concept and it doesn't justify anything in my mind. It's a it's a it's a farcical attempt to justify like and, and basically the way that it's all moral things that the government does. So and what? the way that the terms, the way that the terms of the social contract are laid out, is that you just have a a small group of people that sit around in a room, and decide what they're gonna do with your property, whether they're gonna steal it, how much they're gonna steal, or if they're gonna set new terms and limitations on what you are or are not allowed to do with your property, and if you violate that, then they'll steal your property or put you in a cage. Right. You know. And yeah, the idea is uh, right back to ownership. Uh, you know, uh, communism is uh, an oxymoron. Social contract is an oxymoron. Communism is an oxymoron because uh, you, you know, either you own yourself or everybody owns you. And if just a small group of people are taking ownership of everybody, then they've necessarily given up their own ownership to take ownership of themselves. It's it's an oxymoron. Exactly. And that's what that's what liberty is about, is self ownership. And what, you, what communism you, claims, you decide the terms of your life. You don't allow the terms of your life to be decided for you by some imaginary entity or some group of people who claim some arbitrary authority over you. Yeah. And what communism claims is that uh, under communism Communism property is owned by the collective, owned by everyone. But everyone can't own something because, right. you know, that would mean that if everyone owns this farm, that means that everyone can just go there and take whatever they want. But un even under communism, that's not how it works because you'd be arrested and thrown to the gulag if you tried something like that. If you right. just walked up and took it. But you'd be like, wait, this is communism. I'm a part owner of this too. And they'd be like, oh, no, the government owns it. So, right. So communism, while they claim that everyone is owners of everything, everyone's equal owners, you know, under communism, well, while they claim that, it's not true because the only ones that actually have any authority over it is the government. Yeah, someone has to make the rules, and it has to be one person, ultimately one person, you know. Right. 
even in the United States, while they claim that you know we're a, a democracy and you know Congress makes the rules and all that, well, sure, Congress drafts legislation and they vote on it. Then it goes, you know, the House does, then it goes to the Senate, and the Senate will vote on it. And what it actually comes down to, though, is the president signs it into law. And if the president doesn't sign it into law, it's not law. Right. Well, then and in, the, in democracy, what? Well, I was going to say after that happens, after the president signs it into law, if Congress or someone, you know, wants to claim that it's unconstitutional, then they can take it to the Supreme Court and have them rule on whether or not it's constitutional. But what it really comes down to is that... Further changing the terms of the social contract, and then democracy also doesn't make right. Uh, if ten people get together in a room and nine of them vote to steal the tenth guy's wallet, take all the money out and redistribute it around the room, that democratic process doesn't make it right. You know. Yeah. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, let's call it a night, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Corey, for coming right back the next week. It's awesome. Yep. So, guys. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, take, it here. Uh, take it easy, everybody. Thanks for watching.